Well, I use my two areas of expertise. One is I'm a veterinary surgeon, so obviously I have anatomical expertise about dogs and their body parts, but also I'm an accredited behaviourist. So those two separate areas of expertise are brought together uh, in giving opinions about dogs and their owners which have fallen foul of the Dangerous Dogs Act. Um, the Dangerous Dogs Act has two sections, section primarily section one, which is the section um, relating to banned types of dog, uh, primarily uh, the pit bull type being the only one of real relevance. And section three is the section which deals with all kinds of dogs that are alleged to have done something dangerous. Um, so it, it, this may involve a bite, but it doesn't have to involve a bite. Uh, the owner of a dog under section three of the Dangerous Dogs Act may be found guilty simply if their dog has frightened somebody or made them feel that they were under some kind of threat. Um, and it's, it refers to all injuries as well. So it isn't just biting injuries. If a dog, for example, were to chase somebody uh, and they fell over um, and injured themselves that way, then um, that would fall under this section of the Act. So my job is to then assess these dogs um, most of them are seized, so they're in police custody when I go to see them. Um, and I will give my opinion as to whether, under section one, whether I think the dog is of the confirmation so that it can fall under the umbrella of a, a banned type of dog. And I give my opinion as to whether I think it is, it is of that type or not. And under section three, um, my main job there is to explain, is to give a rationale for why whatever the alleged incident was that happened why it happened and in finding out why and looking at all the aspects of it then you give a prognosis for the future so you, that's what the court wants to know is this dog going to continue pre to present a risk to the public or are there things that can be done to mitigate that risk and reduce it as much as possible um, and in my experience it's certainly nearly always the case that, that there are many things that can be done to prevent a dog acting in that way again As we know, I mean, any dog can bite, large or, large or small dogs. Um, it's in a normal canine behavioral repertoire to bite. Um, my belief is that dogs don't want to be, uh, have to become aggressive, and that generally aggression occurs because from the dog's perspective, there's a context where aggression has become unavoidable. So, um, so there are, there are, of course, and this is why, generally, for most dogs, the prognosis is very good. Um, because once you've looked at the why of what, the why, why did this happen, and look at all the aspects, then you can tease that apart, and, and then for the future you can say what to do about it. And generally speaking, it's rather than just allowing the dog to make its own decision in a situation where aggression may come about, I, as an expert, may be able to predict this situation is going to get difficult for the dog. But on the whole, dog owners don't, um, they don't predict that, that something's going to happen. So once you know that your dog may do this, and you can then reel back to all the factors that come together to, to make the dog feel it needs to be aggressive, that's really my main job in, in terms of finding a reason, uh, looking at the diagnosis, if you like, and the prognosis. And the vast majority of time, if people are given the information in order to predict why their dog did what they did and how to avoid it in the future, it's largely a matter of simply getting the dog to realise that in this situation, aggression is not necessary. You don't need to pull on lead and lunge and bark at that jogger or other dog, for example. That if you uh, use training, and we know a lot about how dogs learn now, that we can actually reverse the dog's uh, feeling of aggression and actually it, the owner can give guidance so the dog does something else in that situation. But the, in my experience the majority of dog bites happened simply because the dog was not told not to. The dog was not at that moment being given the guidance it needed. Um, one of the prime um, situations in my experience is when humans are arguing with each other. And this is now becoming relevant because of the Dangerous Dogs Act going into private property. So that when a, a domestic is occurring, which we know, you know, people argue with each other at home to greater and lesser degrees, 
Dogs are very frequently upset by this sort of uh, situation, but because people are wrapped up in their own issues and arguing and possibly becoming quite aggressive with each other, nobody's actually noticing the dog and noticing the dog's needs. So quite simply, um, taking your, what's going on in your dog's head into consideration uh, and even going you know, out of the house or into another room to have the argument, uh, and then dogs don't feel they need to intervene. But as I say, situations of um, upset at home I predict will, be, will feature more and more now we've got the dangerous dog site in private property. Well, obviously, when we're talking about dangerous, a dangerous dog, we have to be clear what, we're, what we, our definition of dangerous is. Um, owners are most commonly do not believe they own a dangerous dog but the dog has done something that the law defines as dangerous now that's not the same thing as the dog actually being dangerous um, it, you know dogs as people can get themselves into situations where one does you, know, you do violent things you might throw something at somebody or throw a punch at somebody that doesn't necessarily mean to say you are a dangerous person um, out of the dogs that I have assessed for Section 1, which of course this is rather the irony of the, our Section 1 Dangerous Dogs Act, defining dogs as dangerous not by their actions but by what they look like and measurements such as the length of their legs and the proportions of the body to each other. Um, in my experience, out of my cases, only 13% of the dogs that I have assessed, um, which is getting up to 150 dogs, um, have actually done anything that's deemed to be dangerous and quite a few of those those 13% were as a result of people arguing with each other or people um, being arrested so in fact when somebody is being arrested because a police officer may think the dog looks like a pit bull um, if an argument arises there that can then in my experience actually result in the dog doing something deemed to be dangerous um, so this is really the irony of our um, exempt, you know, the register of so-called dangerous dogs is that that relatively small number of them have actually done anything um, that is dangerous at all. They may be um, unruly or untrained or, as I've said, um, as with any other breed of dog, it could be a Border Collie, it could be a German Shepherd, it could be a Chihuahua. But the majority of the, the times when the dog does actually bite, it's simply because the environment has impacted on that dog in such a way that the dog feels a bite is in a, it, it, it can't see any other way out of the situation. So in my experience, the vast majority of dog bites are not a dog that's sort of woken up that morning thinking it's going to go out to attack people. Um, and in fact, I do dispute the use of the word attack, really, because it, it implies an an intention on the part of the dog to actually want to bite whereas my belief is dogs want to do anything to avoid a bite if they possibly can so when bites happen it's it's as I say it's because the context the the the, the situation has got so one layer upon another that the dog can't see any other way out of the situation um, other than to bite um, another common situation of course for for people getting bitten is actually um, fights or scraps between dogs and, and this does appear to that this certainly features a lot in the cases I see so it's not a dog that ever intended to bite a person but people are getting in the way or trying to separate dogs or rescue their own dog uh, and that is how they get bitten and that's not really the same category as a dog that actually is, is, is actually it's a result of the human action that the dog intends to bite that human that is simply an accidental injury in very many cases. In terms of the um, effectiveness of our law as it stands at the moment, even with the, the more recent amendments putting Section 3 into private property, I'm afraid it, uh, my view is it is not doing what it set out to do, which is to prevent dog bites. I mean, that should be everybody's aim. We should be seeing a reduction in dog bites if, if the law was being effective. Um, my view is that relying purely upon a sort of punitive approach, so our, somebody's dog has done something nasty to somebody, um, or the dog looks like, it looks alike, similar to a dog that's of a so-called dangerous breed or type, 
um, is simply not um, being effective. It, it's not reducing um, dog bites. And it's not because it's not educational. Um, punishing one person in one street, in one town, in one county, there's no mechanism whereby that is going to prevent um, an incident elsewhere because there's, we're not learning anything from these incidents. So I agree. I mean, I think we as a society, yes, we, we, we see punishment as justified. Whether it's always preventative is, is a completely different argument, discussion. Um, so we can punish in a retributive sort of way. But what we really need to be doing is collecting data on all dog bites, um, whether it's something that goes to court or not, to actually tease apart all the factors that come together to create a dog bite, uh, whether it's lack of supervision of the child or whether it's lack of socialisation of the dog or whether it's poor welfare conditions for the dog. We know that from other countries, um, if a dog is living in a situation of poor welfare, this, this crops up again and again in, in dog bite incidents of varying severity. So we really, as, as, a, as a country here in the UK, we really should be collecting this data um, to, obviously, primarily one of the things we can do is to confirm or refute whether there is such a thing as a dangerous breed or whether it's just dangerous situations or whether it's just, as I say, all these factors coming together. Lack of supervision of children being primarily one. So many situations and even tragedies would be prevented if a, door, if a door had simply been shut between the dog and the child. Um, but we need to look at these factors, we need to get the data and then we need to use that data for educational purposes um, so that we can have the law and an educational preventative program going along hand in hand. Um, and I think, personally, I think the courts need more powers. The, the, the relatively new crime prevention orders um, ought always to have some behavioural and training recommendations. I don't, I'm not certain that they are doing that. I think they ought to be. Um, but I think the courts need more powers to actually impose training and monitoring after an incident so that we actually see these dogs through and make sure that people um, are actually are following the advice given in the same way as you'd have an alcohol rehabilitation program or a drugs rehabilitation. You need a program, a, a specified program, a protocol for, you know, rehabilitation of a dog if that's what it needs. Well, as regards the suggestion of whether other breeds or kinds of dog needs to be added to a sort of dangerous dog's list, then my view it would be as ineffective as, as it is being at the moment. We can't just do more of what isn't working and expect it therefore to suddenly work. Um, as I've already said, what we need the data, we need to look at actual figures. Um, and the, the perception that, that another breed, such as the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, um, is more dangerous than any other, we, we really need to be looking at the population of dogs. Staffies, Staffies are extremely popular dogs. And so we need to know if you're looking at one, um, one particular area of a country or a town, you need to look at how many dogs are of the staffy type, because whatever the predominant breed is as an area, they will be the dogs that are doing the biting. Um, so, so we can't just look at and, and say, well, look, staffies are doing a lot of biting or causing trouble in this area if we don't have the actual population numbers of that particular dog compared to, other, compared to the proportions of other breeds. Um, so this, again, is where, where data is absolutely essential. But I don't think for a minute that, that adding more so-called dangerous dogs to the list, for all the reasons, really, I've said already, that we need to look at causes, we need to look at... Um, owner training, owner certainly responsibility, although a great number of responsible people's dogs bite too, uh, it certainly isn't just, you know, just in the realms of the irresponsible owner. Because as I said, then, you know, responsible owners don't always predict what their dogs might do either. So I think it's all down to data collection, it's down to actually seeing what the true figures are to support or not um, any further breed bans. Um, but personally, I think breed bans generally are doomed to failure um, and we won't achieve anything by them, um, as, as indeed has been shown in other countries.
I mean, if I were to give one piece of advice to, to all dog owners, really, is never, ever take your dogs for granted. Um, this is how these bites occur. It's because the, the cases come to court are not, we're not picking up, the law is not picking up serial dog biters, dogs that are doing it every day. It, it's most commonly a first time event that this dog bit. It's never done it before. Uh, and it's because people take the dogs for granted that the dog will always behave in an appropriate way without being trained, without being given guidance. So to me, um, obedience training is simply a means of communicating with your dog, giving it the guidance that, okay, you might feel like running over there and chasing that cat, but I would prefer you to stay sitting here instead. And if everybody took none of their dog's behaviors for granted, but could ensure at least that their dogs would always sit when they asked them to, always come to them when they asked them to, um, and to practice it everywhere, not to assume just because your dog will do it in training class, it will also do it in the park, um, or in the kitchen, or in your bedroom. Um, so it's a matter of routine communication with the dog, just checking all the time that however um, upsetting a situation may become for this dog, I can reliably give it that guidance so that the dog will look to me for guidance, will be able to look to me and say, can you now just show me what to do now? That is what so many dogs, they're just looking at their owners, wanting guidance, but they're not being given that guidance. Um, in fact, you know, I watch dogs and people all the time, um, and you so commonly see dogs being walked, and somebody's on the phone, and the dog's like this. And it, it, it's fine because that dog is probably, most of the time, is going to be absolutely fine. It may be fine for all its life. You can't guarantee it. And dogs are simply not routinely being given enough communication with their owners, in my view.